Is my screen visible? Yes, ma'am. It is visible. All right. So we are coming to the management of scorpion sting. You know, quite surprisingly, when I was going through the material that's available, there is so much material. It's almost uh, so much material and so much of uh, comp, so many complications that can be expected with the scorpion sting that I really was surprised because in my clinical experience, I have not seen too many complications happening, excepting uh, local uh, damage to the tissues. Systemic, um, uh, what do you call effect? Ha I've not had much experience, but uh, surprisingly, I have enough information. So the objectives of my session today would be to give a brief couple of slides about scorpion venom, which were already covered in the previous uh, talk. Scorpion venom classification, clinical manifestations, treatment, and I will complete and conclude my uh, session with a few take-home points. So this is already covered in the previous session, the biology of scorpion venoms. The neurotoxins are the most lethal and uh, uh, dangerous toxins available in the scorpion venom. Having said this, the mechanism of envenomation, there is a massive release of endogenous uh, catecholamines into the circulation due to the delayed activation of sodium neuronal channels by the venom. This happens to be the mainstay of envenomation. The main molecular targets of scorpion neurotoxins are the voltage-gated scorpion ch uh, sodium channels and potassium channels, including calcium-activated potassium channels. So because of this, we can see that a lot of complications happen. So now cutting short um, all the details of the mechanism and the etiology and the pathophysiology, I'm going to purely stick to the pre-hospital care and emergency department care of scorpion poisoning. The first and foremost in pre-hospital care is ABC care, that is airway, breathing and circulation. So um, most common presentation of a scorpion bite is excruciating stinging and burning pain at the site of the uh, sting. So as and when, and patients can, the victims who've been bitten can have immediate, in a minute they can have deterioration or it can take a few hours for them to have any systemic complications and have uh, complications with airway breathing and circulation. So whenever there is a suspicion, First of all, observe, identify that there is a scorpion bite or a scorpion sting. I, there is a change. There is, I think, a debate yesterday. With, is it called a scorpion bite or a scorpion sting? Anybody wants to highlight on that? What would you, how many would say it is called? It can be called a scorpion bite. I think we can unmute and probably. Talk. It should be a sting, not sting. the bite, yes. because sting bite, is, bite is not venom. It's not venom. But um, yes. Tintinali textbooks of emergency medicine actually refer to it as scorpion bite. But I, I completely don't don't agree with it. It's a yes. it sting. Yes. So, uh, yeah, so whenever there is a sting by a scorpion, local wound care is very important. What do we mean by local wound care? Uh, till we transport the patient or the victim to the hospital, uh, immobilization of the limb or the area stung is extremely important to prevent systemic absorption of the venom and spread of the venom. So immobilization of the wound is important, of the limb is important. Torrique application, that's very controversial and debatable. Um, many say that there is going to be necrosis of the tissue and absolutely a no-no to the torrique application. But if there is, since we, if we have enough information as to what kind of the area the size of the scorpion and the type of scorpion that has stung. And we have a suspicion that it is quite potent and uh, venomous. Then application of tourniquet one inch above the stung area uh, with the mobilization is definitely going to help and benefit to prevent uh, further spread of the toxin into the systemic circulation. And um, can anybody tell me how, when do we remove the tourniquet? If we have to remove the tourniquet, participants, please. Anybody wants no, to change, say when do we before the color? The, the moment color change in the distal part it starts appearing, becomes congested or dark. That time only. Even if it is congested, yes, that is one way. And any other way, uh, any other time when we would want to remove the tourniquet. 
then swelling of the distal part of swelling to... would be expected cellulitis necrosis of the tissue because of the uh, venous congestion the lymph yeah. congestion and arterial compromise of the blood definitely will cause discoloration of the limb yeah. and uh, will cause discoloration of the limb and swelling no doubt about it but if we are actually applying the tourniquet it is to prevent the systemic absorption of the venom so if we are removing the tourniquet that would be when we have the airway breathing circulation everything in in um, you know in hands reach we have our crash cart in place we have our anti venom we have prazosin we have all the drugs we have critical care setup that is available and we have a patent iv access with fluids running and we have all the emergencies that probably can ensue everything is like taken care of that's when we can release the tourniquet because in case there is a massive surge of venom into the end the toxins and the lactate dehydrogenase ldh going crazy uh, because of the oxidative stress and the tissue damage all these uh, toxins which can be released into systemic circulation if we have our uh, critical care set up and the resuscitation set up well that's when the tourniquet ideally should be removed because the whole point is to prevent systemic absorption of the venom and um, i mean any um, this um, this is um, a personal experience like uh, snake and venomation or anything else a, a scorpion is far more potent though the quantity of venom is less it's far more lethal than snake poisoning also so um, if would anybody want to counter this or give your opinion on tourniquet removal of tourniquet well if not then let me continue with uh, um the pre hospital care there is a belief that you know wherever there is a scorpion sting there is a small incision and the blood should be drained and uh, the toxin thereby can be removed that can lead to further cellulitis and um, uh, tissue damage so that is absolutely contraindicated there is uh, no role of incision and drainage of the toxin with blood at the stung area one very good uh, pain relief analgesia and prevention of toxin uh, absorption to systemic circulation is by application of ice cold ice surrounding the uh, the stung area can cause vasoconstriction and prevent absorption of the venom into the systemic circulation and at the same time can provide decent amount of analgesia there is also um, a belief and a treatment protocol where the stung area like the jellyfish poisoning we were speaking the day, day before yesterday where it can be immersed in hot water hot water which where you know your just your skin won't get scalded like 40 to 45 degree temperature water the stung area if it is immersed there can be very good analgesic effect so either it's hot water if it's available for about 20 minutes or so or ice pack application when the patient is on the go and on way to the hospital so one very important thing that needs to be remembered is no scorpion sting should be taken as benign unless observed for 24 hours irrespective of the species involved even if we know for sure we do not know how a person responds a victim responds to the venom so it's always advisable and beneficial if we keep them under observation either in the hospital for at least 12 hours or a maximum of 24 hours at least at home admission and observation always preferred because in case there is a um, complication systemic complication that will uh, follow through after few hours of envenomation that can be addressed easily now clinical features the the venom as explained earlier too is deposited deep into the subcutaneous tissue after the sting almost complete absorption of the venom from the sting area uh, site would occur within 7 to 8 hours so observation for at least 24 hours makes sense with the 70% of maximum concentration of the venom in the blood reaches reach within 15 minutes of the sting so the earlier we address the sting the faster would be the chance of recovery and prevention of complications severity of envenomation is related to age sometimes the younger population have more lethal side effects and it is observed in some of the studies that 50% mortality is seen for children less than 4 years of uh, age with uh, toxic uh, venomous uh, scorpion bites 
local manifestations. So our clinical presentation is basically divided into local manifestations and systemic manifestations. Coming to local manifestations, we have severe excruciating local pain. It is the only clinical manifestation seen in more than 35% of cases radiating along the corresponding dermatomes. So whenever there is a, st a sting, uh, the most common presentation is excruciating local pain. Local signs such as swelling, redness, heat, re uh, regional lymph node involvement later on uh, are never extensive. Sinks typically do not produce a visible skin lesion like a jellyfish or a snake bite with puncture marks. Typically do not present. There is local edema. There can be articarial rashes. There can be fasciculations and spasms of the underlying muscles, which are, that's a rare presentation, but it can be there. And uh, due to persistent stimulation of pain receptors and the liberated serotonin, which is released into the uh, tissues. Uh, one good way of identifying if it's a scorpion bite is by doing a positive tap test. So wherever there is um, there is ex uh, extensive paresthesias, when we tap on the site where there is local edema and uh, erythema, edema, erythema and pain, wherever the tissue is, there is swelling, one single tap can produce paresthesias and uh, spasms. That is called a positive tap test where we can identify that the, I mean, zero in on our differential diagnosis to a specific diagnosis of a scorpion sting. Due to pain, there is transient bradycardia, transient rise in blood pressure, and sweating with warm extremities. This is the initial manifestation. Most scorpion stings are minor, producing severe local pain and paresthesias without severe systemic involvement. It's also called as a benign or a dry sting. This is the most common presentation which can be taken care of by just analgesic drugs and local pain uh, wound care. We do not have to go for any aggressive uh, resuscitative measures. Now coming to systemic manifestations, scorpion venom delays the closing of neuronal sodium channels as we spoke about earlier, resulting in autonomic storm. Now this is the most dangerous presentation of a scorpion sting, owing to sudden outpour of endogenous catecholamines into the circulation. Systemic symptoms may develop within minutes, but may be delayed as much as 24 hours because we've seen that 15 minutes is the max it takes for the uh, toxin to get uh, to get absorbed into systemic circulation, but the clinical manifestation and worsening can happen up to 24 hours. Features of autonomic nervous system excitation are transient cholinergic and prolonged adrenergic stimulation. So coming to details about this. What is autonomic storm? We have sodium and potassium channel blocking toxins of scorpion venom, which mediate synergistic effects responsible for intense and persistent depolarization of autonomic nerves with massive release of autonomic neurotransmitters, which is also evokes an autonomic storm. So we have a uh, intense and persistent depolarization of the autonomic nervous system with catecho catecholamine release leading to a an autonomic storm. So what do you mean by that? So how do, how do patients present to us? There is initial parasympathetic excitation, which is characterized by vomiting, profuse sweating, ice cold extremities, hypersalivation with ropey secretions of saliva, uh, thick mucus secretions due to stimulation of bronchial mucus glands, lacrimation, pinpoint pupils, diarrhea, abdominal distension, priapism, bradycardia, and hypotension. So can somebody tell me uh, what is a, excepting one uh, presentation, excepting one sign, what are, what other uh, in, uh, toxicity can produce similar picture? Anyone, what, um, what other toxicity um, toxin can produce a similar picture, excepting one symptom? Maybe. Looks like. Exactly. Organophosphate poisoning has almost 95% of similar presentation. What is one differential from an organophosphate poisoning as a differential diagnosis? Pri priapism. priapism. Exactly. Priapism. Priapism because of uh, neurotic cells and stimulation of that can cause uh, what is priapism? That is painful erection of uh, uh, pain. Yes. Yes, the painful, persistent, painful erection of the pain erection. Called as priapism. That is 
one specific feature of um, scorpion bite poisoning that can be seen. Scorpion sting poisoning. I don't know, I'm going back, I don't know where this confusion lies. I think it's food what I've learned. But yes, scorpion sting, one uh, different, one specific uh, symptom and sign is priapism. So an, another, so when there is catecholamine surge into the circulation, we see prolonged massive release of catecholamines like in phomocytoma, which later produces restlessness, pyloerection, uh, marked tachycardia, midriasis, hyperglycemia, hypertension, toxic myocarditis, cardiac failure, pulmonary edema, which are a later presentation of catecholamine surge, unlike the initial autonomic storm that presents to the emergency department. So, yes, hooking up a patient, ABC, having a perfect resuscitation base set up, expecting the worst outcome to cardiac arrest, to crazy arrhythmias. We have a cardiac monitor hooked up to the patient. We have two wide bore IV accesses to take care of the fluid resuscitation. We have oxygen, non-invasive ventilation, uh, invasive ventilation if required. All these cares that are taken supportively for the ABCs. Coming to the ECG, which is the most important thing uh, and most lethal complication that can happen because of scorpion envenomation, we see there all kinds of arrhythmias that can be present. We have sinus tachycardia, we can have multiple VPCs, that is ventricular premature complexes. We have bigeminy, trigeminy, transient non-sustained VT, ventricular tachycardia with the pulse, fatal arrhythmias like VT without pulse, VF, then STT changes. We had an ECG presentation earlier in the previous slide where there can be crazy easy STT changes closely re uh, resembling congenital QT interval syndrome. Brugada syndrome. We have Brugada syndrome-like picture that can be present. So how do we treat these? We basically go by our AT ACLS protocol. So ACLS, when we talk about tachyarrhythmias, all of these are tachyarrhythmias. So having a good IV axis, so we have, as we've learned in our ACLS, we have um, uh, tachyarrhythmias with pulse, that is perfusing tachyarrhythmias, and non-perfusing or arrest-related uh, tachyarrhythmias, which are pulseless VT and VF. And what is the treatment for pulseless VT and VF? Can anybody pitch in? Pulseless VT and VF. Treatment of choice? Shock. Yes. DC. DC. Yes. DC mm -hmm. shock of 200 joules or the maximum available in the defibrillator, be it a biphasic or a monophasic. Monophasic 360 joules, um, uh, what do you call unsynchronized shock. And if it's a biphasic, it's 200 to 240 joules unsynchronized shock with uh, CPR going on. So initiation of CPR epinephrine for part of the protocol uh, for covering the 5Hs and 5Ts and a DC shock uh, that can be um, uh, provided would be the mainstay for all the pulseless tachyarrhythmias that are present. If it's tachyarrhythmia with a pulse, you evaluate further with your 5Hs and 5Ts and see what is the cause along with electrolyte disturbances. So toxins, definitely we know and we need to get our drugs in. In addition to that, if we have hyperkalemia as the possible cause of the tachyarrhythmia, we address it by giving calcium gluconate and insulin dextrose combination and take care of the hyperkalemia while taking care of our um, IV bolus fluids and preparing for anti-venom um, drug, that is scorpion anti-venom, SAV. So, Coming to grades of scorpion envenomation, we have four grades. Uh, basis of clinical manifestation, scorpion envenomation is graded. Grade one is there is local pain radiating along the corresponding dermatome, mild local edema at the site of sting without any systemic involvement, like the base level of, uh, and most of our scorpion bites fall in grade one or grade two. Grade one is just a local pain. Grade two is pain in paresthesias remote to the site of sting. In addition to the local findings, grade three, we have two varieties in that, cranial nerve dysfunction, somatic skeletal neuromuscular dysfunction. So when you're talking about cranial nerve dysfunction, we have blurred vision, roving eye movement, hypersalivation with ropey saliva, 
tongue fasciculations, dysphagia, dysphonia, problems with the upper airway where it is obstructed. And these patients definitely need to go in for an RSI, that is rapid sequence intubation with a airway management with intubation and ventilation. Then coming to somatic skeletal neuromuscular dysfunction, we have again restless patients, severe involuntary shaking or jerking of the extremities that may be mistaken for seizures. So the initial presentation can be roving eye movements, that is, you know, crazy uh, beyond nystagmus kind of movements of the eyes, hypersalivation, restlessness, agitated patients, like a typical OP poisoning, with severe involuntary jerky movements of the extremities, like a seizure. Grade four is where we have a combination of these two. So grade three with cranial nerve dysfunction and somatic skeletal neuromuscular dysfunction, combination of these two is grade four where the patient is critically envenomated and needs very advanced care. Now therapeutic efforts. So what are we targeting when we are trying to take care of scorpion envenomation? We are measuring against, we're taking measures against the venom we are countering the overstimulated autonomic nervous system, we are correcting the hypovolemia, and we are giving symptomatic care. So this is how our target should go. We are, we are having at the background a mental picture of what could be going on. At the same time, we are providing symptomatic systemic care to the patient. So coming to local treatment for grade one and grade two, we have ice packs over the site of the stink, severe excruciating local pain, very effective, more than ice or tourniquet or drugs or anything, all the drugs that can be given, including um, oral diazepam, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. The one thing that has proven to have a very good benefit is by giving a local block with lignocaine. Either we block the nerve, that is if it is, uh, you know, if somebody is uh, uh, experienced in giving digital blocks, if it's a, a finger, you can give a digital block, you can give a wrist block, you can give it uh, at the ankle level, uh, you can give it at the elbow level, we can give a femoral block to um, what do you call, um, uh, 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 provide analysis to the entire limb. So giving either a local infiltration around the wound of lignocaine without adrenaline, because we don't want to compromise on the blood supply, we don't want adrenaline to cause severe vasoconstriction. We want to have a digital block or we want to have a local infiltration of lignocaine followed by oral diazepam for this uh, agitated behavior. So diazepam or any benzodiazepine for uh, calming down the patient and an analgesic with uh, NSAID or with an opioid gives a good amount of local treatment. This can be initiated with ice pack in the pre-hospital care and on arrival to the ED, we can give the local infiltration and then go about our treatment of the systemic uh, manifestations of the toxicity. Treatment of shock. A lot of patients come with hypotension as a presentation if it is a systemic um, symptoms are present, systemic invasion of the toxin. So foot end elevation of the bed, uh, whereby you know we are maintaining cerebral circulation, like uh, Trendlenburg's position. Um, works really well to prevent, uh, I mean, to ensure that the shock is not there. So peripheral, we are get, getting the peripheral blood into the systemic circulation, into the central circulation. But this should not be done if there is a, if, if like delayed presentation, when pulmonary edema is a symptom of, uh, is the main symptom of presentation. Those cases, if we do, we're going to cause a lot of respiratory distress and respiratory arrest and patient is very uncomfortable. So there you might, you will need a head end elevation of the patient. And even if there is a shock, so we go for inotropes to take care of the shock, but not the Trenlinburg's position. So only when there is hypovolemia and the patient's ABCs are good, AB is good, we do a, a foot end elevation of bed or head end low of the bed. Dehydration correction or volume correction is by 20 ml per kg of bolus of any crystalloid, crystalloid in the form of normal saline or uh, ringers lactate, uh, 20 ml per kg as a bolus can be given either, this applies to all age groups. Electrolyte imbalances due to vomiting, excess salivation, profuse sweating should be corrected by oral and parenteral fluids and electrol electrolyte imbalances can be taken care of. Uh, crystalloids to be given in sufficient volume judiciously. So we have to remember in the background that as a later complication, we have pulmonary edema as a 
and cardiogenic shock with severe myocarditis as a picture. So when there are ECG changes, we need to be extremely careful about our fluid administration. So having a bedside ultrasound, I think every emergency department has it as a replacement to stethoscope or as a supplement and a complement to the stethoscope. So having your IVC volumes checked and seeing that the patient is not going into fluid overload, judicious uh, supplementation of uh, IV fluids is good. And if you have time, go for a central venous axis, get your central venous pressure monitoring hooked up to the monitor to target your central venous pressures. So that is the coming to fluid monitoring. Now, next is hydrocortisone. Hydrocortisone, a steroid. Not really, there's again controversy with that. Hydrocortisone has proven uh, to be beneficial in the initial stages of histamine release, uh, where it can be given, which is the shortest acting drug, uh, 100 milligrams of hydrocortisone repeated every four hours. Uh, has proven beneficial in shock secondary to the venom per se, like an anaphylactic shock. So those kind of presentation when there is anaphylaxis suspected, hydrocortisone would really help. So now becomes the magic drug. So all this we were talking about is just the symptomatic care. The magic drug is prazosin. Pharmacologic, pharmacological and physiological antidote for scorpion venom actions. A competitive postsynaptic alpha-1 adrenoreceptor antagonist, alpha-1 blocker called prazosin. It is the magic drug. It has thousand-fold affinity to alpha receptors uh, than the beta receptors. Alpha receptor stimulation plays a major role in the evolution of myocardial dysfunction and acute pulmonary edema. So that is the later complication because of the alpha receptor stimulation. So we need to prevent the stimulation of alpha receptors. So earlier the prazosin infiltration into the body, the better is the outcome. In total, it, re it totally reverses the metabolic and hormonal effects of alpha receptor stimulation. So it inhibits phosphodiesterase, thereby enhancing CGMP levels, which is one of the mediators of nitric oxide synthesis. It enhances insulin secretion. So we've seen that, you know, hyperglycemia is a later presentation of uh, scorpion envenomation. So it enhances insulin secretion uh, that is inhibited by scorpion venom, by which it counters hyperglycemia and hyperkalemia, which can lead to crazy arrhythmias. It reduces preload, left ventricular impedance without causing decrease in cardiac contractility. So prazosin, how do we give it? So it's got so many beneficial effects. It takes care of so many good things and the toxin per se and the uh, complications of the toxins. So how do we give prazosin? It is given, uh, it's available in the plain tablet form. It either is administered orally if a patient is conscious and is talking and airway is patent. If the patient is intubated and ventilated, we have a Riles tube in place. And uh, we crush the tablet, one milligram uh, tablet is uh, uh, crushed and it is given through the Riles tube. Children, the dosage, one milligram for an adult uh, as a stat dose for children it is 30 micrograms per kg body weight. Now, prazosin continuing on that uh, should be given through a nasogastric tube if the patient is vomiting and the patient should be kept in lying posture for about three hours, even during examination. That is if the patient is not having pulmonary edema. If pulmonary edema is the picture that is uh, the initial picture, then yeah, propped up position, irrespective of the first dose um, hypotensive effect. You know, we have this first dose hypotensive phenomena that is seen with prazosin. So despite that, if that is, uh, uh, if the patient should be kept in bed, not sitting or, you know, uh, moving around. Then if the first dose is not completely uh, effective or efficacious, we can repeat the process in one milligram in the same dose, uh, one milligram, three hours, depending on the clinical response. And later, every six hours, but the maximum dosage per day should not cross five milligrams. Till what do we expect? The cold ex extremity. So reversal of whatever the um, effects of uh, the venom, till the reversal is done, we have to continue our prazosin dose. Prazosin can be given irrespective of blood pressure, uh, irrespective of blood pressure, 
provided there is no hypovolemia. So we are addressing hypovolemia from one side, taking care that the patient is not going into cardiogenic shock and pulmonary edema. So a good balance is going on one side. And there is Pravacin administration where there can be hypotension because of the drug per se, but that is the main care, main, uh, care or mainstay of treatment. So we're giving a combination of these two. Since the advent of Prazosin, uh, fatality due to scorpion sting has been reduced to less than 1%. So it has been observed uh, that after the uh, initiation and the use of Prazosin, the fatality has reduced quite significantly. Prazosin is a cellular and pharmacological antidote to the actions of scorpion venom. And it is also a cardioprotective drug. As we've seen earlier, what it prevents, um, it's a, it, it, it reduces the preload, it uh, increases the left ventricular impedance without increase in the cardiac contractility. So it is quite cardioprotective. It should be the first line of treatment for severe scorpion stings. Prazosin is a poor man's, it's also called a poor man's scorpion antivenom. The time lapse between the sting and the administration of prazosin uh, for symptoms of uh, autonomic storm determine the outcome. So the earlier we get the drug in, like an anaphylactic shock, Epinephrine within 30 seconds of presentation, 15 seconds of presentations to the EB. If you give uh, epinephrine, it works well. So the shorter the duration of You are not audible. I think there is some connectivity issue. Yes, am I audible now? Yes, ma'am, you are audible now. Yeah, sorry, I have a power cut here and suddenly my... Okay, no, no, sure. Um, I made you the host. You can share your recipe. Yes, yes. In the meantime, Dr. Sanjada sir has also joined. Welcome, sir. Hi, welcome. I'm sorry I missed a lot of it this time. <laughs> so no issues. We are recording everything. So we'll share the recording with you. Great, you sir. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So Please go ahead. The next session is yours, sir. So... No, no, sir. You will continue with the session. Okay, sir. I am actually en route trying to uh, connect wherever I get internet. Okay, sir. No issues. Right, sir. Right, sir. Yes. So, yes. So, we were at Prazosin. Are we, uh, am I going too fast or am I um, trying to get my point across? Anybody no. wants me to slow down? We will have a question answer session anyways later on. But um, yes, so if I, if I can continue with Prazosin. There is one query which has been asked. And, uh, can you answer that? Because that is a relevant query that mostly Prazosin is available in the market at 5 milligram or 2.5 milligram tablet. Yes. And 1 milligram or 0.5 milligram is. So, to... See, uh, this, this is asked for the guidelines given in most of the books I've seen. But my personal experience is. 5 milligrams, 2.5 milligrams is what we give. Two doses. Can I, can so, I interfere, ma'am? I'm Dr. Das. Yes, yes. Um, if, oh, one milligram prazosin is also available, Sun Pharma. One milligram tablets available, are sir? available. Yes, yeah, it yeah, is available, available. ma'am. One milligram Sun Pharma tablets are available. With, with my experience, we've always given 2.5 and 2.5. But I think, yeah, if it's available, then thank you very much, sir, for letting us... It is us available under the name of Mini Press. Mini itself. Press, yes. Mini Press is, yes. Mini Press is the drug. Uh, anyway, it's available. So there we uh, have but the... Ma'am, one milligram is not available. And if 2.5 milligram we are using uh, twice, yes. then at what interval yes. we are supposed to use it? We are giving at least at the interval of three hours, sir. Three to six hours. Because that, the uh, time is about 20 five, minutes. 5 milligrams for one day. Yes, sir. 5 milligrams per in the first one, first hour, first uh, 24 hours. Oh, thank you, ma'am. 
So we give uh, 2.5. What I have done in my experiences, we give 2.5 milligrams, and we do our uh, other um, what we call uh, supportive symptomatic care. And three to four hours because absorption time is about 20 to 25 minutes, and the peak uh, drug delivery is at about 45 minutes to one hour. So we wait for four to five hours, and we repeat in case there is again a repetition that you know there, there's autonomic surge is coming back, and we feel that the symptoms like giving atropine, for example. For uh, OP poisoning, so as the symptoms are getting reverse and there is pinpoint happening, we start giving some more atropine or organophosphate. So similarly, when the symptoms are getting worse and again, we give the next two point five, brush it and give it so that you know there is a time gap of one hour for the drug absorption to go to its peak from the time of administering the drug. So is the question okay? I mean, answered enough. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, so prazos, the time lapse between the string sting and the administration of prazosin is extremely important. Cardiac arrhythmias are many times self-limiting. So we have transient VTs, transient uh, uh, VPCs. So as we start taking care of the hyperkalemia, we take care of the uh, hypoxia, we start giving prazosin, we start taking care of the antivenom. The arrhythmias that are transiently there will remit by itself and they are self-limiting. So we don't have to aggressively uh, take care of the arrhythmias. They are there, they need to be very carefully watched till they go into a pulseless condition. So if there is a bigeminy that is present or multiple ectopics that are present, and when do ectopics become pathological? Ectopics are not pathological all the time. So when can we call ectopic beats pathological? Can anyone... Um, probably pitch in or give your opinion or fine. When we have more than three ectopics in one 25 centimeter strip, one screen strip in an ECG, more than three ectopics, that's when it's considered as pathological. So if we have a pathological ectopics, we have bigeminy, we have um, uh, what you call prolonged QT intervals, we have um, uh, run, short runs of ill-sustained VT with the pulse. We need not address them aggressively at that point. We start taking care of our uh, systemic absorption of the toxicity and automatically the arrhythmias will get reverted. So when we have still persistent tachyarrhythmias and we need to interfere, we can go for beta blockers, IV in the form of metoprolol or uh, espalol. They work really well. If there is bradyarrhythmia, again, with very low heart rate, we go for atropine as an immediate SOS. Like it's like, you know, two plus two is equal to four. Mathematics, you don't, it's an algorithm. You don't have to really understand why it's happening because the understanding part is taken care of by giving the antivenom and the prazosin and the fluids and the hyperkalemia correction. So that's the background work that is simultaneously running. But if there is tachyarrhythmia that is going and the patient is probably having very high rates, we can bring down the rates by giving... Uh, IV beta blockers. If it's very low rates, we can give IV atropine. Hypertension and pulmonary edema to offload the heart and reduce the workload, we can give, we can reduce the afterload by giving nifedipine, nitroprusside, hydrolysine, prazosin, and also take care of the pulmonary edema by giving uh, IV diuretics, loop diuretics. So advanced supportive management, again, we have intubation, mechanical ventilation whenever necessary. Um, so where patient presence with copious amount of secretions, so ropey secretions, which can cause airway obstruction. So keeping that in mind and uh, taking care of the airway uh, in an elective fashion is always good. We can extubate the patient once the venom is better, if they come with severe systemic absorption. Breathing oxygen supplementation is the main stay of treatment and keep a close watch on the respiratory rate and the respiratory arrest that can happen because of the neurotoxin that can be present. So one of the most common presentations is respiratory arrest uh, because of the neurotoxicity. So oxygen supplementation, pulmonary edema, if it's there, then very early NIV support in the form of BiPAP or CPAP. Uh, pulmonary edema care by giving nephidipine, re reducing the afterload and giving diuretics. Respiratory depression from the medications itself. So somebody presents initially with uh, exaggerated anxiety and they're uh, agitated, they're throwing, they're throwing seizure-like uh, episodes. 
the the main stay of treatment is to give benzodiazepines and opiates for analgesics so these drug effects itself can cause a lot of respiratory depression so along with oxygen supplementation because of the toxicity we have to keep the drugs the iatrogenic that is a side effect of the drug that can also cause and complement the respiratory depression so that needs to be addressed and if you if you feel that there is significant respiratory depression please go ahead and electively ventilate and intubate and ventilate these patients till the systemic circulation till the respiratory uh, effort is taken care of and the breathing is taken care of circulation again we have iv fluids we have crystalloids we have inotropic support with dopamine and dobutamine at 5 to 15 mics per kg uh, it is advocated for 36 to 48 hours if the patient is going into hypotensive shock warm hypotensive shock with a pulmonary edema where you are having a myocarditis setting into picture and a lot of systemic complications so initially fluid bolus and if it is going into myocardial uh, myocarditis with a shock cardiogenic shock please we need to switch over to dobutamine as a dopamine and dobutamine as a uh, first line of treatment coming to disability so a b c d we have to have a suspicion in the earlier present uh, speaker sir, sir spoke about uh, having uh, ischemic or hemorrhagic uh, bleeds inside the brain so there is uh, altered mental status and there is respiratory depression please do remember that it can be the toxicity it can be the effect of drugs or it can be an ic bleed or a stroke that can give a uh, mimic this kind of picture so the reason is whenever we are looking at it have a holistic picture of the patient or of the victim rather than going that you know the toxicity is what is causing this so when we are giving some drugs we might uh, forget that there is a possibility of an ic bleed that can be associated and that should not be overlooked so having every um, when you having a think of reasons why the airway can be uh, compromised if there is b think of reasons can be that can compromise the breathing because while remembering this we will ensure that we do not leave any stone unturned we are taking care of every possible aspect that can lead to the clinical presentation so coming now to scorpion anti venom how many of you have had experience with scorpion anti venom anybody has anybody dr vivekanshu has have you worked with the um, scorpion anti venom it's something a mystery sir we have read about this the scorpion anti venom but we have not used it mm -hmm. till now yes yes i neither have i any experience with it so if anybody any of the eminent speakers or the participants has had any experience please put in your uh, valuable um, you know experience because i personally have not had an experience with scorpion anti venom that's why we have uh, well, we are all sitting together to sir. know about it if uh, anything which is <laughs> yeah i can give you the textbook literature but not a personal experience yes i can so understand. talking yeah so talking about scorpion and uh, anti venom it is effective if victim is brought in an at an early stage of this is mostly available in mexico and other areas where uh, african areas not in india so far with what information i have uh it is uh, effective if a victim is brought at an early stage of scorpion sting in a stage of uh, acetylcholine excess that is a cholinergic um, uh, you know autonomic uh, storm and is there with an ongoing cholinergic phenomena is suggestive of free circulating scorpion venom neutralization so that is the time we give scorpion anti venom it is given as an infiltration uh in iv fluids normal saline uh intravenous administration of anti venom rapidly reverses the systemic toxicity features but no pain it does not reverse the pain and paresthesias it takes care of a systemic circulation so your bradycardia tachycardia shock hypotension or hypertension uh symptoms they get better but the pain and paresthesias remain so the main stay of treatment for that would be again a local block or local infiltration of an um an uh, anesthetic drug like lignocaine that is the considered still uh, till date as the best analgesic that can be given the no test dose like uh, for jellyfish or for uh, uh, snake which we give we test dose is not required for uh, scorpion anti venom as there is a high circulating catecholamines and anaphylaxis is very rare 
So directly we can start infiltration. And nowadays, I think nobody is going for this intradermal um, allergy tests. We don't do it in our hospital. We go for IV, uh, very slow IV infusion and watch for any complications to happen. And we stop infiltration immediately. So we don't, uh, intradermal testing uh, is no more the, uh, you know, the, the thing that is happening nowadays. I, I don't know about the remaining institutions. So we go for directly IV test dose, like maybe, you know, eight drops. We started at six to eight drops per minute for the first 10 minutes. If there is no shock that is developing, 10 minutes close monitoring, then we go ahead at the usual rate recommended. Addition of SAV to prazosin enhances recovery time and shortens hospital stay. Other studies that have been done, it, it is shown that L-carnitine in a dose of 1980, about 2000 milligrams per day in three divided doses, till the left ventricular function normalizes is found beneficial if there is a myocarditis kind of picture with cardiogenic shock and pulmonary edema. So this is a study that is done from emergency services of tertiary care center in Andhra Pradesh, uh, showed no mortality and got benefited uh, irrespective of severity of the sting. This is study done in my own state. Um, so that is one other study. Then there is there, there are trials going on with uh, immunization with scorpion venom toxoid, like the TTV get or the DTAP or part of the immunization schedule, they are trying to give the scorpion venom toxoid as a part of immunization in Mexico. So conclusions, we have local wound care and analgesia is sufficient usually. All scorpion bites need to be observed for 24 hours. Autonomic storm is the crucial stage of scorpion sting. Cardiogenic shock later manifests of a manifestation of envenomation. Fatal pulmonary edema is the most common cause of death. Earlier ventilatory support is helpful. Prazosin is still the mainstay of treatment across globally. SAV is best used in early stages of envenomation, preferably along with prazosin. Thank you. Um, I conclude my session and uh, any questions I think we can collectively answer. Thank you, ma'am. The audience can have question answers with the uh, It was a very, very nice presentation by Dr. Chudupi and almost all uh, Uh, two things that you have to communicate is a controversial issue and uh, incise in local sites should not be done. But uh, uh, the once there is excessive salivation and involvement of cranial nerve at home care level, one should not give any food to eat. Actually, one should avoid uh, giving any sort of drinks or food to the victim and should not be allowed to sleep. What do you see? Hello. Am I audible, Dr. Bivekanj? Hello. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Now you are audible, sir. So, so you got the question that food should not be given once there is excessive salivation or respiratory distress or involvement of cranial nerve. Absolutely, so all, sir. Yes. And uh, the victim should not be allowed to sleep also. Yes, sir. Hmm. And what about this? Uh, yeah. And when there is uh, encephalopathy or involvement, there is cerebral edema and all that, uh, what do you feel about the role of mannitol or hypertonic solution? Sir, hypertonic. Yes, sir. Mannitol is still used in my uh, center. Mannitol is the mainstay of treatment for encephalopathy. Okay, this is what I wanted to say. You can go to the speakers, other parties. Yes, sir, definitely. If anyone has any queries, feedbacks, they can text in the box. Now we'll be coming to the next presentation. That will be the presentation of Dr. Sanjada, sir. So I will be, uh, he is right now not able to join us to uh, personal obligations of the office. So I will do his presentation.